Good evening, everyone. I'm Georgia Davis, and welcome to AZ Illustrated Nature. Coming up next in the second part of our two-part series, we take you to an urban farm that is producing locally grown vegetables and protein using aquaponics, a fish and plant combination that is spreading in our community. Also, the Western National Parks Association is honoring various residents, including a talented young writer. And we'll take you on a tour of the University of Arizona campus Arboretum. But first, here's a look at tonight's headlines. The ACLU of Arizona filed a brief with the U.S. Supreme Court today urging the justices to turn away Governor Jan Brewer's request for a review of part of SB 1070 that's still on hold. Last year, the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals blocked part of SB 1070, which would make it illegal to harbor someone in the country illegally. And the governor wants that decision overturned so the anti-harboring statute can be enforced. Beginning this summer, 50 Tucson police cars will be equipped with Automated External Defibrillators, or AEDs, thanks to a donation by the Stephen M. Guter Foundation. AEDs are medical devices that deliver an electrical shock to reestablish the heart's rhythm during sudden cardiac arrest. Police officials say often officers are first on the scene for medical emergencies, beating EMS crews by minutes. The American Red Cross says the chance of surviving sudden cardiac arrest drops 10% for every minute defibrillation is delayed. Sudden cardiac arrest is one of the leading causes of death in the United States, killing around 350,000 people each year. The donation is valued at $100,000. The deadline is approaching for people ages 14 to 21 to apply for a paid summer internship with a local employer. Pima County organizes and pays for the annual program. Interested people have until Friday to apply for the summer youth program. Pima County pays minimum wage for those who are accepted into the program, even if they work for private companies. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. The world's growing population and diminishing resources have many people trying to start green businesses to support sustainability. Here in southern Arizona, a new generation of entrepreneurs is experimenting with an ancient tradition as part of a commercial venture for the future. They are spreading the message about aquaponics, a system that can provide fish and plants for human consumption by using relatively fewer resources. Last week we told you about an aquaponics farm northwest of Tucson, but tonight we're staying in the city, where a typical urban backyard is undergoing a green transformation. This story is produced by reporter Tony Paniagua and photojournalist Bob Lindbergh. When Sean Herman wants to eat some fresh eggs for breakfast, he simply collects them from his backyard chicken coop. If he would like some sweet peas for a meal, he visits this garden next to the chickens. And if the menu calls for catfish, there are plenty of specimens from which to choose just a few feet away from his house. Herman's backyard is effectively a miniature farm. It's a bountiful garden oasis that may appear improbable in our desert, but can provide different types of produce year round. Throughout the year, we've had lots of success with smaller tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, uh, yellow pear tomatoes, um, Armenian cucumbers, zucchini. Right now, we're growing uh, broccolini, kale, chard. Uh, the list goes on and on. There, there's so many possibilities. And Herman credits most of his agricultural success to the aquaponics installations in his backyard. Aquaponics involves a connected system of tanks where water circulates between fish and plants and each can benefit. I've been gardening in Tucson for about 10 years and just really struggling to grow food in soil. On YouTube actually I found a video on aquaponics uh, and it just seemed like a, a lot more efficient way to grow not only plants uh, but fish, as, edible fish as well. That piqued my curiosity and I've been hooked ever since. I've been totally obsessed with uh, designing and building systems. Herman is spreading that enthusiasm with his business partner Stefan Herbert Ford who founded Local Roots Aquaponics in Tucson. It's catching. Um, 
it, it's amazing the interest uh, that's just exploding right now. There's already a pretty active gardening community here in Tucson, um, but a lot of people struggle with water usage. And once they learn about these systems and they see how easy it is to operate them, they jump on board. The company sells and installs these systems and provides tips and information on how to keep them flowing and growing. Herbert Ford actually has a doctoral degree in astronomy, but he is very attracted to planet Earth. I got into it because I just wanted to follow my passions, basically. Um, I've been a longtime fan of organic gardening and a longtime fan of sustainable technologies. And when I learned about aquaponics, uh, the water conservation and the efficient way to grow food, um, it just brought everything together for me and I realized this is what I wanted to do and I wanted to help people do the same. Even though aquaponics has flowing water and may appear wasteful in the desert, Herbert Ford says this method of providing nutrition actually saves water when compared to traditional operations. This precious resource is recirculated and recycled. In general, the fish wastes feed the plants uh, and the plants in return filter the water for the fish. Um, you're actually growing three things in aquaponics. You're growing the fish, the plants, and the beneficial bacteria that really do the magic that makes it happen. The fish produce a lot of ammonia. That ammonia gets naturally converted into nitrates by the beneficial bacteria living in these grow beds. These are living biofilter grow beds. Those nitrates eventually get consumed by the plants and taken out of the system. And the clean water at the end here can be pumped back to the fish. Right now, the men are using commercial fish food for the animal portion of this cultivating apparatus, but they are also experimenting with growing their own. That way, they can keep accurate records of what goes in and what comes out. We've got a few things growing in this tank. We've got microalgae that minnows and guppies uh, eat and grow off of, and as well as some freshwater ghost shrimp. And then we also have this floating duckweed on the top. And this is a floating water plant that's very high in protein and it's actually really good for fish to eat. So we're doing different experiments and just trying to raise as much local fish food as possible. Aquaponics may sound scientific and experimental, but the men say it's also attainable and sustainable, although it's not the end-all and be-all for everyone. Some root crops do better in traditional gardens in the ground, and the structures require oversight and commitment. You cannot just install them, plug them in, and walk away. Also, the upfront cost may be a deterrent for many people. It is expensive to set the systems up initially, but over the lifetime of the systems, it's actually one of the cheapest ways to produce food. And it's effective, they point out, in many places, including the desert southwest. One thing I've had on my mind is that basically the availability of arable land and, and clean water is, is on the decline. Uh, so th this is a solution because we're, you're, we're saving water and we're basically creating ecosystems independent of soil quality. And Herman predicts the interest in aquaponics will continue to take root and flourish, spreading to many more backyards like his, whose owners are seeking locally grown food supplies and sustainability. Now we are joined by Tony Paniagua, who is here with some additional details about aquaponics. So, Tony, it's good to have you in the studio. Nice to be here. So, we just saw in the piece that there's a cost to doing aquaponics. So, tell us a little bit about what you found when you're out doing these stories. Yes, Stefan was saying that when he goes out and talks to people, one of the challenges is the price, at least for some people. So, what he and his partner, Sean, are doing right now, they're concentrating on what they call as a family system. It's about a 300 gallon tank and that's where you put the fish and then you get the grow beds for the produce. They go out, they install it, they give you everything you need to get going. They charge about $2,200. That's for one of these systems, 300 gallon tanks. However, um, Stefan says that if you are a do-it-yourselfer or you know somebody who's talented, you can buy the equipment elsewhere and probably put together the system for about half the cost. Is there any sort of hit on your utility bill? Approximately right now they're saying it should be at less than $10 a month. Um, Stefan is doing research with these systems and he has noticed that the electrical bill has gone up somewhat, but he was doing the math and it's probably closer to $5 a month to run one of the family systems. Of course, if you have more, then you'll pay extra as well. But in the long run, when you, you factor out the cost of groceries, it's really not that much. Yes, and, and he's saying, for example, that uh, right now he knows of a family who bought two or, uh, yeah, they bought two family systems and they have not had to buy any additional produce. 
And this is, of course, once you get the system up and running. So if you consider that you're getting organic produce and you're growing it in your own home and you know what's going into it, it could be a good purchase. Uh, they think probably you'll get your returns in about two or three years from the initial investment of about $2,200. Well, last week we heard that a lot of people are using tilapia as a fish, but what are some of the other kinds of fish that people are using in these systems? Interesting conversation with Stefan about the fish that you can uh, use, you can raise in these systems. He says the favorite one so far has been the catfish. It's very resilient. It can take very cold temperatures. It can take high temperatures. Tilapia are tropical fish, and they don't like the water once it hits 60 or below. Uh, he was telling me that they typically stop eating when it's about 55 degrees, the water temperature, and then at 50 or below, they start to die. So that's something you have to take into account if you're going to have tilapia here in Tucson. Sometimes we do get the cold nights. If gradually the water turns really cold, the tilapia are not going to thrive. Another option is the bluegill. He says that fish is good, it's hardy, but it doesn't eat as much and doesn't grow as much and it's a little bit dirty, so it's going to cloud up the water. So there are things to consider insofar as the plants and the animals that you get. And of course, for those who don't want to eat the fish, we've got like koi and goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. There have been situations where people want the systems, the aquaponic systems, but they don't want to kill the fish. And that's very legitimate. We spoke to somebody at Maggie's Farm Aquaponics last week who says a lot of people just don't feel comfortable with killing the fish. They'd rather get filet. If you're a vegetarian, you can just have the nice fish, look at them, get the produce or give the fish away to somebody else. Why not? Fish are kind of fun. Yeah. I have them myself. So we think about this as a new system, but how new is this idea of aquaponics really? Well, apparently it's been around for centuries. Uh, thousands of years ago, uh, studies have shown that the Chinese were doing something like it. And then the Native Americans, specifically the Aztec, the Aztecs were doing that as well. So it's been around. And of course, what's going on now in modern society uh, is credited to Dr. James Rakosi who was a researcher in the 1960s in the Virgin Islands, at a university in the Virgin Islands, and he is credited with being sort of like the, the grandfather of modern aquaponics. So lots to learn here. Uh, we should point out that there are some uh, meetings that are held here in town, uh, Tucson Aquaponics Project, and there are also some uh, things that you can take part in, uh, some workshops to learn more about these systems. Oh, interesting. Thanks for coming in. It's my pleasure. And of course, you can find out more about aquaponics and click on some links to get some more information on our website at news.azpm.org. Next, we introduce you to another young aquaponics entrepreneur whose business is doing better than he expected right in the middle of the city. 28-year-old Brendan Moltman has a degree in corporate finance and accounting. A couple of years ago, he was working in Flagstaff, Arizona as a manager of a plant nursery. But one day, he decided to take a chance, change his life, and the rest, they say, is history. We started next door as weird plants, aquaponics, and organic gardening. And then when we moved here, we expanded with the aquaponics and the organic gardening. The aquaponics business is amazing. Um, people are very, very excited about it. What we're finding is probably 99% of the people are do-it-yourselfers. They want to buy the supplies from us and set it up on their own. Majority of the questions, I'd say the biggest question is, how does this save water over my garden? Most people's first conception, because it's flowing water, is you're actually going to use more water. So once we get past that this is about a 90% water savings, they're usually hooked. I would recommend this for many reasons. Number one reason is someone like me who's busy all the time, all I have to do is feed my fish, top it off with water once a week, and I now have produce. Um, you get about a 90% water savings, as I said. You get about, it average, people say different things, but what I like to say is about three to six times the growth rate, and you can plant about three to times as densely. So in your standard garden, you're going to have to space everything accordingly, where here everything can almost be touching because the nutrients are always going by and they're not competing. I think it's here to stay. I don't see it as a fad. I think people are realizing that you can get the bigger production, the faster growth, as well as the protein. So a lot of people are concerned about where meat's coming from and other things, so they're turning to fish. And then now the issues raised about fish with nuclear waste in the water and the oceans, uh, the way farms are raising fish are very unsanitary. So a lot of people want to produce their own protein as well. So instead of a standard garden where you still have to find your protein, here you have your protein and your vegetables. This came about, I was kind of tired of my old job. So I moved down here in 24 hours, rented a spot. I actually started in the warehouse next door, a 600 square foot warehouse. 
Um, I was in there for about a year, and then I moved over here and started actually growing the business. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, the latest on the crisis in Ukraine and efforts to ratify an international treaty on disabilities. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. Bridget Schulte's own life inspired her to write about a national deficit of leisure time. I felt like I was working all the time and yet never very good at what I was doing. I was a working mom and so I was so guilty and so I was up at two in the morning to bake cupcakes for the Valentine's party. I'm David Green. Why so many Americans feel so overwhelmed. That's on the next Morning Edition from NPR News. The Western National Parks Association is a locally based organization that helps support the National Park Service. It operates stores at 66 national parks in Arizona and 11 other western states, and it has donated millions of dollars to their missions. This Saturday, March 15th, the group is holding an annual event to recognize several people for their contributions to the natural environment and our parks. We are joined by two guests with more information. James Cook is the executive director of the Western National Parks Association and Maya Wallace is the winner of the National Parks Essay Contest. Thanks to both of you for coming in. Thank you. So Jim, I'm gonna to come to you first. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Western National Parks Association, what you do, how you do it, and we've got some books here. So what are these here for? <laughs> well, thank you. So Western National Parks Association has been around for 75 years, and we're an education organization, basically, where we provide products programs and support research at all the national parks that you mentioned in 12 western states. We're, we're anchored here in Tucson. Uh, one of our core activities is book publications, as you uh, pointed out. Two of these uh, publications right here are ours. There's another publication there, The American Indians in the Civil War, that uh, we also sell at our store. So our, our mission is to educate the public and really enhance their experience when they go to national parks. Right, and something like American Indians in the Civil War, that's not something we hear about in our, our history books often. Indeed, and, and that's really a story that's not as well told uh, in our history books. And so uh, this pub particular publication came out this year, and they will be featured here at the Tucson Festival of Books on Saturday and Sunday. All right, so Maya, let's go over to you. So you're a senior here in Tucson. Yep, I attend Sabino High School and I'm the president of my FFA chapter. All right, so what is FFA for those who don't know? Um, FFA stands for the Future Farmers of America and it's a program that is intracurricular and it focus or, focuses around agriculture education. And it, so it really engages youth into career development and leadership and personal growth. So what got you interested in thinking about parks? Well, actually, um, seeing as I've been traveling with my family a lot, I was actually born overseas. Uh, I, my very first trip here in Arizona was to the Grand Canyon. And so I think a lot of people don't realize, like they see different national parks and monuments, like in magazines and on postcards and in pictures, but I think you can really never feel the experience unless you've been there. Like, I don't think people realize how big the Grand Canyon is unless you've really been able to be there and experience everything. And so really I've had a strong um, passion for agriculture since I was a little girl. And so I really love working with animals and plants and everything. So I think nature partially got me involved with national parks. <laughs> Fair enough. So, and you write about this, of course, in your essay, which I just read. It's beautiful. So Thank can you, you read a piece of it for us? As an African-American, the question of importance of the national parks weighs heavily on my heart. My family has always been big proponents of the national parks. Hiking the trails, canoeing, and camping were mainstays for us growing up. Since the importance of parks has been ingrained into my psyche since birth, that is the only thing that I have ever known, and I'm a proud supporter. But I think about other African-Americans or 
low-income minority populations that reside within inner cities and how they might not have the resources to go to national parks. Many have probably heard of the Grand Canyon or Yosemite, but can appreciations for these sites truly be transferred from a picture book or lyrics of a song? With each passing generation, the importance of parks becomes less and less of a concern, and with it, humanity as a whole suffers. So yeah, Jim, I actually want to come to you on that latter point because you know now everybody's so involved in their computers and the internet and technology. What does that mean for parks? Well, I think parks are at risk ultimately. And in, in fact, this year, this theme uh, that we've posed to the public is, do national parks matter? And that's the essay contest um, sort of framework that, that Maya responded to so well. Um, we, we're concerned about the future of national parks because there are so many distractions in our country now and across the world, in fact, uh, yet national parks really represent the best of our natural heritage and the most important of our American stories, those stories that really tell the history of America, the struggles and the glories of our country uh, are really captured in, in national parks. Truly, when you go to a national park, you have a visceral connection that happens that's unlike a computer screen or reading about it in a book. As powerful as those things are and important as those things are, uh, we do want the uh, future generations to value national parks as, as we do. So that's why we sponsored this essay contest uh, to engage youth in the question, do national yep. parks matter? And uh, uh, fortunately, in Maya's case, she's had a lifelong connection to parks, uh, but we're really concerned that more and more people know less and less about parks. So we're really trying to do everything that we can to engage um, urban audiences, diverse audiences, and youth in our mission. Right. Well, how do you convince someone to get out to see a park if they're not interested in that? Well, I really think that we need to start with the younger generation because I feel like the older generation does have a lot more influence on people. But really, I think if it's start at a young age, then children will be able to actually see and get interested and they can bring their families to go and go to national parks. And that's actually one of the things that the FFA has a sister organization is the Ag in the Classroom. And so what it actually does is the FFA focuses primarily on eighth through 12th grade for getting you involved for careers and everything, but also to get kids interested in the agriculture field, the ag in the classroom provides some different lesson plans and different things for them to be able to learn more about farming and get interested about it and not be afraid of agriculture and everything. And so it really gets them involved. So I'd mentioned in my essay that I think if there could be something similar created for national parks, I think that would really get kids interested. They would go home and talk to their parents and ask them questions, and they would really want to go and see these th different things for themselves and learn pieces of history and stuff. So It would work for me, that's for sure. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for coming in. Thank, thank you. you. Many universities are known for their educational opportunities, their scientific research, or their revered sports teams. But what about the plants on campus? It may sound surprising, but some university grounds are also living laboratories where you can learn about a world of plants, all in one location. The University of Arizona's campus Arboretum is one example. This story is produced by Arizona Public Media apprentice Anna Agostowska and photojournalist Andrew Brown. In the early years of the university, during the territorial period, um, one of the major needs in the state was economic growth. So many of our faculty in the College of Agriculture set about to travel worldwide to uh, bring back plants that were from other arid adapted regions that could perhaps be introduced here as an agricultural commodity. Here on the University of Arizona campus, the uh, campus itself is the Arboretum. An arboretum is simply a collection of woody plants that are specifically set aside for um, their value as research and educational uh, resources. We have uh, about 9,000 woody plants and cacti that are on record on campus as part of our collection. 
They represent about 550 different types of plants from six continents. We have behind us uh, in this uh, important historic uh, cactus garden uh, representative of a, a, a bujum. It's a very interesting looking plant. It draws a lot of attention to this garden. It's like an upside down albino carrot. It's one of those rare plants in Tucson that will leaf out during the winter time uh, because of the cooler temperatures. The simple fact is that we're a land grant school and because we have this special responsibility as a land grant university to make sure that our research and our educational programs are applied to solving problems that are of relevance to the state. Most trees in urban landscapes live about 10 to 20 years. So they're not living long enough because of how they're cared for and maintained in order to ever um, bring about the environmental benefits that we plant them for. We know, for example, that worker productivity increases 15% by having access or spending a few minutes every day outside in a green space. So again, what a wonderful opportunity to have a campus that uh, is so lush and green uh, in order to provide that increased productivity to our employees and to our students. I'm, uh, you know, just catching a little moment of relaxation between, uh, what do I have this morning? Physio and biochem. Well, there's not too many comfortable places to sit on campus, so I figured I would provide my own. You know what I mean? And I can nap and things like that at school. So it's good just to grab a coffee and chill out between classes. I am interested in uh, creating a generation of future land stewards, of responsible citizens who have some understanding and respect for the landscapes in which they inhabit. I think it's just good planning by the school and the fact that they can have all these buildings and 40k plus students, but they still have the uh, you know frame of mind to plan out the campus in a way that's productive and still relaxing. You know, it's good. Most of the trees that you see behind us are olive trees, but we have a variety of other trees here, including carobs. We have uh, pine trees, casserinas, a variety of plants from all over the world that are represented right here on the western border of campus. It offers the opportunity for people to come in and to experience something similar to a natural environment, a green space, a public green space. So at lunchtime, you'll often see many people uh, coming here to enjoy their lunch. Uh, you'll see people enjoying the space as a recreational area. And we also try to use, make use of the products that are produced by the trees in this area. Campus Arboretum has a really important outreach function in taking all of the educational resources, all of the knowledge that we have about urban landscapes and plant health, uh, and extending that knowledge out into the community. So the plant tours are one way that we do that, and all of the resources available on our website are another way to help introduce the public to what we've learned here in 125 years of studying desert horticulture. And that's our show. To keep up with the latest news or to watch the segments from this or any other editions of AZ Illustrated, you may visit our website at news.azpm.org. I'm Georgia Davis. Thanks for watching.